So I say good morning. I'm meaning good morning back. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. So wonderful to see you all. Welcome to the 16th annual No Place for Hate Falmouth Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast. This is the first in person since 2020. So it's especially exciting. I want to acknowledge some public servants and dignitaries who are with us today. Uh, Laura Tour, Superintendent of Falmouth Public Schools. <laughs> Andrea Thorold, Vice Chair of the Falmouth School Committee. <laughs> Sam Patterson, a fellow member of the Falmouth Select Board. <laughs> Peter Johnson Staub, interim Falmouth Town Manager. <laughs> Margaret Souza, also of the School Committee. J. Marie Stevenson, Town of Mashpee Diversity and Inclusion Committee. <laughs> Michael Kasparian, President and CEO of the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Senator Sue Moran. <laughs> Representative Dylan Fernandez. <laughs> Representative Kip Diggs. Congressman Bill Keating, and our new district attorney, Rob Galboy. So for all of my fellow DAC members who didn't make it to your table, it's because you got bumped out by big wigs. So. <laughs> um, I also want to say thank you to FCTV for filming this for us today. And thank you for all of the crew who are here. I'm going to edit this. Uh, back at the studio okay. for us. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you to Seacrest, the staff, and Clark Gwynn for hosting us again in this amazing room. We have this beautiful view and all of this space and this wonderful room that we're enjoying today. And to No Place for Hate Falmouth, if I could have everyone who is a volunteer or on the steering committee Stand if you're able, or at least wave your hand so we can thank you all for the work you put in here. <laughs> awesome. I realize I forgot to introduce myself. I apologize. My name is Angela Scott Price. I'm Vice Chair of the Thomas Director. <laughs> so to get us started today, I'd like to welcome the Reverend Rene Perez, pastor of John Wesley United Methodist Church, for our opening prayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here and appreciate the invitation. It's a great honor to be here with you to share this prayer. Would you pray with me? Holy are you, O blessed one. We greet you and give you thanks for the sacred hope that brings us together this day and inspires us to live as people who seek peace, justice, and truth. We are your creation, made to live in love and unity, and called from the wounds of our mothers to be holy instigators of the brighter future you have promised us all. Thank you for the strength of those who came before us, for our fathers and mothers, for prophets and pioneers, for visionaries and messengers whose faith, values, and dreams led them to offer their lives for the greater cause of liberation and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you for we, us and them, not divided, but all one, can stand on the shoulders of people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, John Lewis, and many others who freely and fully gave their lives for the sake of equality, justice, truth, love, and belonging. It is in your name, and because of their cause, our cause, that we are gathered here today and say thank you. Thank you for them. Thank you for us. Bless our gathering, bless our purpose, bless your people. Let it be so. Amen. Thank you 
you, Reverend. Now I'm really excited to introduce Lynn Busher's fifth grade class from Morse Pond for signing a selection from Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. kids know about my favorite people. He's one of them. And uh, we learn a lot about the black experience. They'll learn about Amanda Gorman and some others as well. But um, Dr. King, uh, yes, on Friday, uh, Rabbi Lieberman came and talked about his personal experience with Dr. King. And the kids were amazed because they knew about his rally and about his life. So. Without further ado, here are the Busher Van Dyce students. Thank you. 
another round of applause for that. Thank you. It's really beautiful that every year we have a group of students come and recite some of MLK's words to us as a reminder that they are the future. And as long as we continue to teach them and they continue to grow, our future will be different. So very grateful to those students and the teachers. And next I would like to have Pamela Rothstein to present the Falmouth Civic Leadership Award. Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see this room filled again with our community and to see so many of you for the first time. Isn't it just a wonderful thing? I would like to call um, up Mr. Hauke Kite Powell to stand here with me as I present this award. Several years ago, the No Place for Hate Steering Committee decided that um, we should introduce an award to people and organizations in our town and in our community who embody that spirit of dedication and action and dreaming and working towards making this community a better place. This year we are pleased and honored to honor the Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee with this award. Hauke serves as the chair of that committee and he'll have a chance to speak afterwards. So I want to present you with a little background, some facts, and then the spirit behind this organization and its work and why we bestowed this award on them. The <clears throat> Woods Hole Advisory, Diversity Advisory Committee was established in 2004, so they've been at this work for some time, when the leaders of six Woods Hole Science Institutions signed a memorandum committing their institutions to work together to attract and retain a more diverse workforce. Sounds familiar, isn't it? It's a struggle that we're still engaged in. That memorandum established the committee as an initiative and the initiative in turn established an advisory committee to make recommendations as to how the institutions can make the Woods Hole Village and the institutions there more diverse and, more, and make it a more inclusive community. But the work of that committee goes way beyond the Woods Hole institutions. That in itself is worthy of recognition. But the work of this committee has broadened in these almost 20 years to help shape a community in Falmouth and on the Upper Cape that educates about diversity, that brings us fresh perspectives and experiences through all sorts of means. And I want to tell you about some of those because that information is not included on the paper that's in front of you on your table. Let me tell you just some of the activities that this committee has organized in the past few years and more and more come out every year, and that's one of the reasons why we recognize them. Black History Month, the upcoming month of February, is filled with activities which will soon be posted, and again, those are open to the public, usually a series of lectures, the uh, Harambe, uh, and other activities. Hispanic Heritage Month, they recognize and have events. Native American Heritage Month, Juneteenth programming, the a lecture series, several listen up sessions that were held within the past few years, really enlightening one experiences of students of color on the Cape, another stories of race on the Cape, and for some of these events they partner with other organizations uh, in town. Um, they have another stories of race in Woods Hole, listening as allyship. They have a, in that 2019, they uh, marked that year of big changes in our country with an open conversation. They've held film screenings and book discussions. They have themselves a diversity award and they have a student program. They are so active. And in short, the spirit of this organization is one of teamship, partnership, collaboration. We recognize and honor that. Of looking at your task and broadening it as the needs of for education and inclusion only grow. We applaud that. 
and for involving so many people from so many different institutions, we applaud that. So one of the things we want to do is to recognize anyone who has ever served on this committee to stand up now, if you would. So No Place for Hate Falmouth Civic Leadership Award presented to Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee, MLK Holiday Breakfast, January 16, 2023. May you continue to envision a better place for people to live and work, to educate us about what that might look like and what our past experience is, and to make positive change in our community and in your institutions. Uh, and for this award, uh, on behalf of all the current and former members of the Diversity Advisory Committee, uh, the leaders of the Woods Hole Diversity Initiative, and I also want to recognize all those who, uh, for decades before there was a Woods Hole Diversity Initiative, organized Black History Month events in Woods Hole. That tradition goes back to at least 1981, and I'm sure many of you in the room have contributed to that work. Um, I also want to thank all the community groups that work with us. Uh, this is critical, I think. Uh, we can't build a welcoming and inclusive science community in Woods Hole without also building a larger welcoming and inclusive community in Woods Hole and Falmouth and Adelon. So I appreciate all the work that all the community groups who've partnered with us have done and continue to do, and I hope that continues. And I want to acknowledge two people briefly who I think deserve special mention in this context because without them, I don't think there would be this initiative or any of the programs that it currently produces. One of them is John Bullard, who in 2004, as the president at the time of the C Education Association, uh, spearheaded the effort to bring together the leaders of the six institutions in Woodsville and form this initiative. That was uh, a foundational contribution and I'm always grateful uh, to be able to acknowledge John's work in that regard. The other is Ambrose Jurel, um, and I think Anji will have more to say about Ambrose shortly. Um, but Ambrose, like John, is an inspiration to me. Uh, and, and he was there at the beginning of this and continues to be, I think, uh, spiritual guide for the work that we try to do. So I deeply appreciate uh, having been able to work with him and get to know him. And many, many others. There are literally hundreds of people who've been part of this uh, in the almost 20 years now. I'm not going to try to list them all for you. I do want to say one more thing um, before I sit down, and that is um, I, like, I like tying things together. And, and so I want to try to do that a little bit here. Dr. King was a man of faith, and he drew much of his inspiration, uh, his vision for a better world, and his strength to fight for that from his faith, as do many of us today. I want to suggest to you that, as a representative of the science community in Woods Hole, you can get to the same place by dedicating your life, uh, your approach to life, to the scientific process of understanding the world. I think that there are fundamental truths out there to be discovered, and you can get to them on different paths. And the path of science is one that I think is particularly useful and relevant in this context, because Science is the approach to understanding the world that is designed around the notion of eliminating 
prejudice and eliminating bias from the way we see things, the way we interpret things, the way we interact uh, with the world. I can't try to describe what's going on uh, at a deep sea vent community based on the observations that I've made down there with instruments if I don't understand the filters and biases and limitations of those instruments. In the same way, I'd say, I can't claim to know you, I can't claim to know the world around me, if I don't understand the limitations and filters and biases of my mind and the sensory organs that feed that mind. And so, to me, uh, a dedicated exploration of how my own mind works and why it works the way it does leads me to the work that I do with this Diversity Advisory Committee and I think that it's a path that I recommend to all of you. Uh, you are welcome to, if you don't already do this, engage with us in the science community in Woods Hole. Uh, and I look forward to walking down that road together with you. Thank you all very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Napa. That was beautiful. I, I do want to add a few more comments. I am also co-chair of the Woods Hole Diversity Advisory Committee. And I'd like to acknowledge, again, uh, Dr. Ambrose Jarrow, who was the first chair of the DAC back in 2005, and really spearheaded a lot of the initiatives that we see today. And he brought me here, so you can blame him for my presence. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. And one more person, George Lyles. George has been on the DAC from the very beginning as well, and I've talked to Dr. Jarrow many times about various things at DAC, and I've learned that it was because of the minutes that George took and his accuracy um, that we, we know so much about the history of the DAC and the DI, and we're able to make real change. So thank you to you, George. Thank you. Now, as I welcome Henry St. Julian up, he's going to be talking about community in our beloved community. And I think it's so fitting that the DAC receive this award today as we're talking about community because the DAC is a community. It is made up of people throughout the community. And it's only through community that this work really gets done. And so I thank you all, and I look forward to hearing from Henry. Now let me introduce you. I'll get up here. <laughs> Mr. St. Julian began his current role as Falmouth Public School DEIB director in 2022. Born in New York City, he grew up in the nation of Haiti for the first five years. He then returned to the U.S. as an English learner student. He received a BA at Gordon College, a master's degree in education at Framingham State University, and a cer certificate of advancement graduate study in educational leadership and management at Fitchburg State. He began his teaching career in 1994 at Wareham High School as a history teacher, and then became the assistant principal at Falmouth High School in 2016. His work on diversity includes leading a global education team in Falmouth, promoting local diversity and international student engagement, as well as multiple student diversity clubs in Wareham and Falmouth. Welcome, Henry. So I was going to be very clever, and I had uh, music and walk-up song. <laughs> Spiritual. So that's a good. That's a I, my speaker died on me. Please, there's gonna be a lot. This is gonna be showing what's going on here. Um, my speaker died on me. That was my walk-up song, and I want to get a sense of the song that uh, marginalized people feel. That sometimes they feel like a motherless child. That's what we're dealing with. That scripture, that spiritual is old. Dr. Martin King mentioned that, and uh, it still resonates. 
So today we're going to be talking about some things that are going to be uncomfortable. You know, they talk about Thanksgiving, you don't speak politics, you don't talk about race, you don't talk about religion. Good luck with that today. <laughs> so uh, I, I want us to get into that kind of mode. Um, I'm going to talk about creating this beloved community, I'm going to talk about the description of the problem, um, the vision, and also the recommendation. Now I look at across this room and there's so many people I know, so many people I love, oh my goodness. And so many people that can actually do this speech instead of me. But I would like to just humbly uh, get some pointers, get some things, and maybe just going and, and, and going from there. But I, I appreciate, I see a lot of the warriors here, and I recognize them. I recognize the warriors are here. So um, I'm going to start off with the creating a beloved community. Oh, that's not okay, good. Um, and I wanted to say that we are creating primarily this relationship, this, this vision is a, is a communal relationship. And we can't do this alone, so I want to start right away by thanking Dr. Dorr for allowing me to do this in, uh, in, in the school, public schools. I am the DI uh, in the public schools, so my target area is in education. Please know that even though my target area is in education, I would like you to think about all areas. And um, I'm, I'm glad this, there's a couple members of the school community here that are, um, that's, that's part of their, their goal. So I'm so glad for that. I also recognize that I have two students here, Terrence Davis and Tegan Lin, that are gonna be coming up soon. It's a communal aspect. So I, I come in here, it's not just on me, it's on all these people, school committee, superintendent, and students that are gonna be doing that. And so, um, we're going to be creating, we're going to be talking about how we can create a beloved community, but as I talk about education, you have to look in your in areas of influence. Where are you influencing? Uh, my motivation for today is on two books. Uh, my goodness, what a great book. The last book that uh, Dr. King wrote was Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Profound book. It's online, by the way, you can get it for free. I, I purchased uh, the, the audio and I'm just driving going, oh my goodness, this man, this man knows how to speak, this man knows how to write, this man's words are so powerful, it's amazing. And he is dealing with, where are we now? 1967, he's got about a year left of his life. 1967, where do we go now? And then his last um, speeches are a, a theme called The Other America, and he's, showing his frustration. Things are not going the way he would like it to go. And so 67 to 68, he, he's writing these, he's going to uh, places primarily in the north and talking about it. And he's dealing with issues and protesting around. No protests around here or yet, but he was doing protests. He was coming in Detroit and they were interrupted like 11 times. So we're going to be talking about those things, and I want to make sure that I make sh that I recognize this and um, let you know that when Dr. King was making these uh, situations right here, these uh, literature, he was frustrated. He saw the civil rights movement having positive, successful aspects. He saw the the passage of the uh, '64 civil rights. Uh, Bill, he saw the passage of 65 voting bills. He was there at the uh, March on Washington. He's got, um, you know, Nobel Prize winning. He saw all these things, but failures. He also saw the Watt riots in 64, the Harlem riots, the burning of churches, the attack of, the, of many civil rights people. And so in this light, he's going, what should we go now? What should we do now? So the problem, let's talk about the problem. The problem right now is chaos. He has a book, we have chaos or community. Where are we? And he saw it in chaos. One aspect was uh, people were so excited about the dream, so about, excited about the I, I have a dream. And they saw the vision, they go, yes, we like that. The problem with that is there's work to be done before the dream. People today, Go right to the dream. They go, right, yeah, we shouldn't be dealing, everyone should be the same. Everyone should be treated the same. But there's work to be done. Because there's chaos right now. 
And when you go from the work, if you skip the work, you're going to see that chaos. And so that was one problem. One problem was that. The second was uh, many Americans, many African Americans, were dealing with discrimination, segregation. There are no laws that was going on in the North, but they're still dealing with discrimination and segregation. They were not seeing the same footing as the white race. Riots were coming up. Now let me be clear, Dr. King did not like riots. He has a non-violent movement. He made sure, he, he, he pleaded with uh, many of the uh, black activists and saying we got to keep it non-violent. And he understood though the plight. And I love one of his quotes or uh, in Michigan, there were, there were riots going on in Michigan as well, and he basically said in Gross Point, Michigan, he says, um, I must say tonight that a riot is the language of the unheard. The unheard. Do you hear me? When someone says, Black Lives Matter, do you hear what they're saying, or are you going to make excuses? Do you hear people? when they cry out. In 1967, uh, Dr. King spent uh, time of isolation, so he's getting frustrated. And so he goes to Jamaica, spends some time in Jamaica, and he really tries to pen uh, the book that uh, I'm, I'm talking about here, and he's saying, you know what, we had before, in the early 60s, we had this, this time period where um, we, we, we took away some of the inconvenience the, the problems, the, the laws that's going on, you know, it, it was almost like a charitable act to some people, especially liberals. You know, we want to make sure the blacks are not being attacked and we want to protect them and, and we're going to have those laws. But he said there's another step. We want full equality. This is not just let's give them some things to keep them content. But he went, let's give them full equality. When we start going full equality, then, then you're going to see some conflicts. And he saw that. He definitely saw that. And so uh, he basically went, and there, there's many times where during, um, uh, when he was writing his literature and, and now he's starting going up to the north, he went to Stanford. If you look up the uh, writing, uh, the, the speech that happened in Stanford, California, Michigan, and New York City. It's this aspect of, there's this other America. Do you understand this other America? And so, let me give you a quote of these uh, other America, and it's gonna basically show you the chaos that's going on. You can take some laws, but are we dealing with the central issue? So I'm gonna ask my students to come on up. They're gonna read the quote for me. Come on, both of you guys, come on. I'm really here. And so the speech is called The Other America, and he basically said this speech multiple times, and so, He's trying to point out to America the real problem. Why are people rioting? Why are people arguing right now? What's the problem? Didn't we do these laws? Didn't we do these things? And so, let's start with you. <coughs> One America is beautiful for situation. And in a sense, this America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. This America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, and cultural and education for their minds, and freedom and human dignity for their spirits. In this America, millions of people experience every day the opportunity of having life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in all of their dimensions. And in this America, millions of young people grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. In a sense, the greatest tragedy of this America is what it does to little children. Little children in this America are forced to grow up with clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental skies. As we look at this other America, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. Many people of various backgrounds live in this America. Some are Mexican Americans, some are Puerto Ricans, some are Indians, and some happen to be from other groups. Millions of them are Appalachian whites, 
but probably the largest group in this other America in proportion to its size in the population is the American Negro. They'll be coming back. But you know, there are people that says this country is a fantastic country. And it is. And they'll say this is a wonderful country. And there, there's no, no real problems. But what America are they looking at? What America? Are they, do they see the whole America? Or do they see their little cultural bubble? And so, let's make sure we're clear about this. Dr. King saw two Americas. And this created chaos. And if we want to do, we want to keep it this way, chaos, we do nothing, we just keep the status quo. But he says this, the real problem is racism. The real problem is that it's not limited to, and here's the question right here. So a lot of people say racism, I'm not racist. But they say, you know, is it limited to cross burning? Is it limited to lynching? Is it limited to segregated facilities? Is it limited to laws? Or is it a philosophy? Is it something in the mind? Is it a philosophy and a faith? We talk about faith here. Is it a faith that one race is superior and have all the right answers? And so he is trying to, dis to, to explain in this speech that there is racism of inferiority. Should one race be happy and content with this country or does there need to be consideration. Do we need to look? Race should be considered a, is it a problem? A headache? Why don't we talk about race? Is it a headache? Is it a problem? Or is it reality? And so people don't talk about racism, and I want to make sure that we discuss it right now. Uh, Dr. Kelsey, uh, one of his contemporary, Dr. King's contemporary said that, racism is the philosophy and faith of a superior race. It is the dogma of one race is inferior and the other race is the sole hope and advancement and progress. Only one race is the birth of all progress. Only one race is the hope of all progress and positivity. It advocates a myth of inferior people. Do we have that? When we say, hey listen, uh, am I racist? Is that seeping in? Do we have damage by that? Do we have damage on that philosophy? Do we understand that racism is, is alive and well today? And so we're going to, in education, we look at that. We, we talk about different um, data that goes on in education. We look at suspension rates. We look at uh, achievement rates. And if we say, listen, yeah, I see one group achieving, another one not, and that's OK. Are we accepting the myth of inferiority? Or do we see there's a problem? If we do not accept that, then we need to look in. And uh, Dr. King was a major DEI worker. He had his data points. He's not just doing education, but I'm in education. When I saw it, that he was throwing out data and saying, listen, it's not what I feel. Let me show you the data. I got excited. I go, oh, he's the DEI of America. So I love that. So, now what I want to talk about is the vision. The vision has um, here, basically King has this vision, Dr. King has this vision and dream of a beloved community. And I love that he quoted a, a founding father. Thomas Paine, who was creating of this country, says this, and I love how he uses this. He basically says, who dared to proclaim, we have the power to begin the world again. We have the power to begin the world again. And Dr. King is saying, we have that power. We have the facility. We have the, uh, the means, but do we have the will? And that's what we're talking right here. And so we want, do we want change for community or we want to maintain the, product, the, the uh, chaos? Nothing, everything will remain the same if we do nothing. So to do this, I want to give um, this vision, this beloved vision, a modern take, and I want to bring back my two students here. They, uh, they picked up these two images, and I want them to explain those two images up here. So they have their image of, uh, who's going to go first? You going to go first? Okay. 
My beloved community is a neighborhood where all people with parents looking out for us while all of the children play together. You can see that they're all a community. They're all there together and they're all one people. Um, my beloved community is represented by Penn being held by many people. So the Penn is education where all kids thrive and everyone is involved with the work of equity and inclusion. And it's not just one group of people or one person. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you, um, I, I love the Warriors. I'm sorry for people that couldn't see the video there. Uh, I'll make sure it happened here. Let me just say this. Uh, I love that this crowd is phenomenal. It's my Warriors and it's a great amount of people, but we need more young people. We need the young people to start making this, this vision. We need to make sure that we bring them in here as much as possible. And uh, you, who are older, <laughs> It is your job to grab them. It is your job to bring them in. I came in, I said, I'm bringing my two young people here. It is your job to do that and bring them in here. We need to do that. Uh, I don't know if you heard about Yolanda Renee King's uh, speech on uh, Friday when he's doing the amazing speech. She's got some uh, character. Uh, let me tell you, she's the only granddaughter of Dr. King, and she did the unveiling and the embrace uh, statue. I've not there yet, but I. Snow is going to keep me away, but I can't wait to get down there. But uh, she called, I, I love her words, she says basically this, uh, there's a quest for a just and loving, peaceful word, world. And we, not her, she's the only dog granddog, but we are the children and the grandchildren of Martin and Coretta Scott King. We are all challenged to carry forth the unfinished work, this unfinished work. We are there. And she saw that we're the, we need to do that. And so this is unfinished work to create a beloved community. This world, how do we want to live in this? Chaos or community? The path to chaos is, come here, have breakfast. Pass to doing chaos is, have a couple of um, meetings and uh, sitting around and um, talking about it. But that's not the work. The work is a lot more than coming to a breakfast. The work is a lot more than talking about it. And I would like to make some recommendation about the work. So my first recommendation. All right, this is a cute kid. All right, so this is Lui Lui. My nickname is Lui Lui. Uh, but please, uh, be with me, I'm a teacher, I'm really a teacher, I'm a history teacher for many years, and uh, we have to have these little cute little uh, tools to help us remember. But I, I use this first tool right here, is know your reread. There's four, four things, but I want to talk about know your reread. This is a hard one for me, so please bear with me. This is, the, um, this is essential, is to be aware of your reread. As a childhood, my nickname was Riri, and first stage begins with this. You're going to take a deep, depth, deep look at your Riri, your inner child, who you are and who you were raised, and understand the impact of racism. Consider me. I was born in this country a black boy from immigrant parents. My first language was not English until my first grade. Um, I went to school among a majority white community. Not here, but uh, Framingham and Marlboro. I was in remedial classes up to high school. Only had, I never had a white teacher. I mean, I'm sorry, never had a black teacher. Only white teachers. Always left different, look, thought of less than. Am I smart? Am I good looking? among my white classmates. Teachers were shocked, shocked, that I went to college. My parents told me later on, later on in the parent meetings, they were shocked that I completed college. They were shocked that I'm a teacher. This is the atmosphere, the culture that created me. 
In this environment, I taught history with one perspective. As a young teacher, I promoted the status quo. I instructed students on the one America, not the other America. And I want to say right now, I, it, this is hard. I would like to apologize. I would like to apologize for today for promoting a white supremacist education. It starts with me. It starts with me. Are you aware of the impact? of this, this culture? Are you aware that there's racism? Are you aware that it doesn't affect white people? It affects us all. When you say I'm a racist, you have to look at you and say how does that impact me? And then that's the first step. That's the first step. Don't go to, the, don't go to dream. Find out what is it about you that you've been tainted by this, by this uh, philosophy. Do a re-reject. Now, the next thing is, how do I know? Because everything about me is about reread. So there's another thing is expand your range. So not only do you know your reread, but expand your range. You have to basically, uh, it's great that you say you love this culture, you love your area, and you're not saying other places are more superior. You're saying that, but, but do you really understand the impact, the problem that's in your life? And so therefore, I'm asking you to know to grow and to seek diversity. Challenge, the best place to understand your Riri is who you're hanging out with. Who do you see? Who do you listen to? Who do you read? Who's talking to you and challenge you about your own culture? Expand your range. Expand your friendship base. Expand your literature. Is it women authors? That was a big thing. Am I, am, I listen, am I reading authors from women? What am I reading? Am I dealing with, uh, who am I dealing with? Are my coworkers only the heterosexual coworkers? Am I dealing with only one type of America? Who do I cheer for during the uh, World Cup? Yes, American team, fantastic, but we are surrounded by Brazilians. <laughs> Who are your friends? Who are your mates? And so, therefore, I want to humbly say that we have to consider the others. I had a fantastic talk. Um, Pamela, was, um, Pamela was here. Uh, Ms. Rothstein was here, uh, where she's right now. I want to thank her. Uh, she brought, she came up with a school, and she started talking about how can we expand students' range? And she had some amazing, where is she? She's somewhere around here. There she is, okay, there she is. I wanna thank her because we had some great uh, conversation and we're like, let's expand <laughs> students' range. Who do they know? And so we're, we're making some plans to expand those ranges for students. Right here is, um, I like to thank, uh, in the middle right there is uh, Cameron uh, Greenbeer from, uh, and he works with the, the tribe and he, he and I started to expand the range of students with the uh, knowledge of Native Americans. We need to start expanding that, and so I thank them. I, I, there was some library, I don't know my school librarians. My school librarians are on the front lines in this expanding range. They're looking at their books, and they're basically saying, we want to expand the reading of students in the library, and let me tell you something, they are being attacked in that, in that expand, because most people would like to see the one America in the little books there. We need to protect our librarians. And I like to say I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Catherine Rodriguez. Um, I still have her library book, so uh, <laughs> I said I was going to give it back to her, but I still have that. Uh, that, that never changes. Um, I like to thank Barbara Berg over there, who basically is saying we need to expand our knowledge about Cape Verdean, and she has the, the Cape Verdean Museum, and we need to understand that. We need to expand that. We need to look. And you know what's awesome about the Cape? There are so many awesome, beautiful 
cultural um, places, and we got a Cape Verdean highlight over there. We have to go to there. Those second, was it second graders or third graders? Second graders? Second graders, oh yeah. So that second graders going over there and checking out. We are expanding knowledge. We're checking out our read, we're looking at it, we're talking about knowledge. The third one is this. The third one is to build relationships. Let me tell you right now, we are building relationships. What you see here is a coalition of conscience. We're doing a coalition of conscience. We're getting people together, and we are basically, we're creating. We're not tearing down. We're not dividing. We're not tribalizing. We are building. We are building. These are, this, is my, uh, this is my teachers look at this, and they're like, what are you doing, Henry? It's chaos. Uh, <laughs> No, it is, these are different groups of teachers that are going to lead the work. It's not me, but it's going to be many teachers leading the work. This is an equity team, and we are going to have multiple people leading the work. And I thank my directors, the district directors and principals that are doing it. They, they are allowing, they're picking up, and they're saying this. It's not just a one-person job. It's my job. It's not just a one-person job. It's secretary. It's bus drivers, it's teachers, it's students, it's custodians. It is everyone's work to do the beloved community. Loving students is a relationship. That's our goal. If you say something, what we're trying to do, we are loving students. That's our goal. It's called our relationship. We are loving students. Sometimes I have a hard time saying what I am. I'm a DI because I know it's going to cost some stuff. But I got to say, my job is to love students. And it's by relationship. We're going to love others. We're not building up, we're not separating, we're loving people. That's our goal. It's tough, but that's what we need to do. When we go out there and you say, uh, what are you doing? What, are you, what, what kind of work are you doing? We're loving kids, we're loving people. We're loving teachers, we're loving students. So the last one, and I thank you for giving me time to talk, but the last, uh, the last R we had, we know your re read, check your reading. You want to expand your range. We want to um, build relationships. This one's tough. This one is spec times of repair. Let me tell you, there's been hundreds of years that racism has ruled, that white supremacy has dominated, that uh, it's, a, it's a generational impact. It impacted me. Let me just say that. Say, oh, it's, it, you know, what about, it impacted me. And so it is going to cause a lot of chaos. And so you need, to res you need to understand that there's going to be times of repair. When you go out there, they're going to start attacking you. They're going to start hating on you. You're going to help in the repair. You're not going to run away. You're not going to divide. You're going to, you're going to uh, find a creative way to repair. That we're here for what? We're here for loving people. That's what we're here for. And so uh, we need to create an inclusive classroom and some of the times when kids get in problems and you see some problem in classrooms, uh, teachers are going to say, you know, this person's problem, let's, let's push them away. Let's, let, 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 let's, let's uh, suspend them or let's do whatever. I'm asking teachers, and I'm asking you in the same way, we need, we need to heal that harm. We need to bring the kid back. We need to bring the child back. And we need to find out what's going on. What's happening here? You know, suspensions and detentions and separation doesn't heal. It doesn't solve problems. We need to bring people back, back. And that's the inclusiveness that we're talking about. And so this is a hard work. This is probably one of the hardest work. Because people, they want to show you their culture. They want to show you who they are. And we're asking that you bring people, you build people back and re help repair. Uh, the, the achievement gaps we talked about right there, we need to see our kids, love our kids and say, that's wrong. Where are my African Americans in my AP classes? Where are my African Americans in, um, in my advanced classes? Why are, are we spending all those kids in IEP and they have social emotional help? What's happening to that trans student that is, can't get in the classroom? and dealing with so many things and basically is not doing what he needs to do. What happened to all those students that come from Brazil and they are, they're struggling and they're seeing some clashing? We need to repair that harm. Don't just ask this, the DEI worker coming up and oh, he'll fix that. No, teachers, administrators, everyone need to come down and heal the harm. I'll tell you one, um, and this is a, 
I'm sitting there with a, a, the um, a department head, and he's one of my, this is uh, Michael Feeney, who's uh, from the history department. He is a champion, and he's basically saying, you know what, we want to do our part. We want to make sure our teachers do their part and heal that harm where kids are not achieving where they need to do. I love that we're partners in here. And with the suspension rates and stuff like that, there's one thing that I could, I could have a whole new study on school to prison pipeline, I won't do that, but there's a statistic here that we're in a job of teaching kids. We're not preparing for prison. We're not preparing for that uh, promoting the, the cultural norm. We want to teach kids. This is so hard, but let me, let me tell you. George Floyd died in 2020, and I had this friend, conservative uh, friend of mine, basically, it was, um, it, you know, we weren't as close, but, <laughs> sorry. But the death came, and he came to my house. And he said, I understand. It's sad to say that that's what it took, but he said, I understand. And he lamented. Not guilt, I love this. Not guilt, but he lamented. He stayed next to me. And he, he basically just listened, and he lamented. Guilt basically, you know, we can't do anything. We can't have guilt, I'm wrong. Lament says, I am coming to sit right by you. I'm coming right by you. From that point, that night is, I, I live in Wareham, I'm sorry. I live in Wareham. At that point, there was a, um, a visual, and he and his wife, and my wife, my kids, we went to visual together. And to that day, we talked about different aspects of the race. We don't, race is not a bad word. Race is in a conversation. I just saw him recently, he goes, oh, I gotta read another book, we should talk. That's the healing. That's the lament. And we need to heal. We need to listen. We need, the lament is a sacred time to understand your brothers and sisters and to listen, to support, to come alongside. We need an inclusive, beloved community. It's not easy, but it's a must. An inclusive. There's no throwaway students. There's no unimportant staff members. All are important. We're building something. The harm of racism in America must be repaired. It can't be just, oh, it must be repaired. And so, we got the reread. Reread effect. We've got the range. Know your range. That's knowledge. We've got the relationship. We are not doing this alone. We've got the repair. What are we going to do today? What are we doing today? Today, the struggle is not just in education. It's in all areas. Choose today. Choose not the status quo. Choose not chaos. But will you promote a new model? Will you start thinking about your reread? Will you start expanding your range and seeing other people? Will you start building relationships? Instead of that turn down and canceling people and going crazy on social media, we're going to build. We're building. And expect repair. Are you doing all these things? And so many uh, things I, I, I ask that, that you will take this message and share with those young people. And so there's so many people I want to thank. I, I, there, I, have, I thank so many people here. I do want to thank uh, uh, Reverend Fields and uh, Rabbi Lerman, who have just been, I, I think the faith leaders here in this community are just on the front lines for healing the other Americans. I just want to thank them for that. I'm so sorry, uh, I, there's so many people I could say uh, thank you, but it's important that the coalition is not one person or one leader, but it's a coalition of consciousness. It's not just one man. So therefore, I want to thank two other women. Uh, I, I also want to thank my coach, my mentor, my compass. Uh, 
I, I want to thank you for that. I, I don't know what I can do without you. Siana Mubusi, thank you so much. If she's not your coach, get hold of her, but make sure you don't take away my time. She is amazing, amazing, and I, and I apologize to your wife for taking her away from me. I, 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 I want more. But anyway, I also want to thank my, my biggest fan, my partner in life, my wife, Wendy St. Julian. I can't do that. So I want to end, because this is hard work. Took a lot of me. Thank you so much for allowing me, not a, not a big speaker, but thank you so much for allowing me to do this. But I want to end with uh, uh, just two, a blessing, a Jewish blessing, and a Christian, a Christian um, prayer. Jewish blessing says this, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And for the for the uh, prayer, God, that your holy and life-giving speech may be so moved in every human heart, especially in the hearts of America, that the boundaries which divide us may crumble, the suspicion disappear, the hatred cease, that our division being healed, that we may live in justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, everyone. community that we say we see. So with that, I would like to leave you with Pamela and Rabbi Elias, along with Ted Jelinek and Rich Hill, to sing, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> Will you just vamp for just a moment, please? <laughs> Thank you. Pamela, Nell, Sayana, Olivia, would you join me? These are my fellow members of the steering committee of No Place For Me. It occurred to me this morning, just this morning, this is how we always end this wonderful gathering, by singing this very powerful and moving hymn. But it occurred to me that today, I need to translate that refrain. What does it say? We shall overcome one day. It's aspirational. It's a hope. But as I sing it today, I'll be translating for myself. We must overcome. Today. Every day. Thank you. Sing it together, please. If you are inclined to join hands, that's even more wonderful. But if you're not comfortable doing that, that's fine as well.
Shalom, 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 Shalom,